So it's time for you to get a big cup of tea or a big cup of coffee and strap in for the That Was The Year That Was 2019 video and a look ahead to what could be coming in 2020. So before we get further into this video, I would just like to say a massive thank you to all the subscribers and all the viewers that have been watching um, this channel over the past year. Um, the subscriber growth of this channel since December 2018 has been absolutely phenomenal. Just the amount of subscribers that this channel has gained since 2018 um, and the viewership has remained it's remained steady all the way through this year. It's remained steadier. Some other channels are struggling a lot, not so much with subscriber numbers, but with viewer numbers. This channel, not so much. There is a there is a constant a, a constant um, stream of people that are watching the videos at least semi regularly. The other people I'd like to thank are the people that have made twenty nineteen the first full complete calendar year of self-employment for vaping with Vic the business and that's all the people at Patreon all the people that joined up to subscribe star after the Patreon debacle and now all the people that have signed up for the YouTube membership system that didn't want to sign up for for Patreon uh, or for subscribe star all of you um, all of you help pay the rents rates electricity, gas and all the rest of it uh, for the studio and the storage cupboard studio next door which hopefully I'll actually get around to converting in 2020 uh, and also pay for all the equipment um, that I use on a daily basis including the equipment here that I'm using for the what's up as well um, that I use for the Vaping with Vic channel without the patrons, the subscribe stars and now the YouTube members um, Vaping with Vic as a business would simply not survive because it is the case that yes I do have sponsorship links in the description of the video but they're not paying all that much to be honest um, and yes I do take fast track payments but the bulk of the income is still from the crowdfund sources it's still from patreon subscribe star and the youtube members so a massive thanks to all the people that have subscribed to this channel all the people that have viewed this channel and a, and a special massive thanks to the patrons the subscribe stars and now the youtube members let's get stuck in about this shall we oh almost forgot <laughs> Also a massive thanks to everyone that voted for me on the eSig Click Best of 2019 Awards. Vaping with Vic is now the UK's number one reviewer for the fourth year running. Technically only for the second year running actually because the first two years eSig Click was lumping all the reviewers in the same category. But yeah, four years running. I've got that award for now and the Vaping with Vic Facebook group came second place uh, behind Drip Hacks I think it was for the Facebook group so again massive thanks to everyone that voted in the eSig Click Awards I am seriously toying with the idea of doing uh, of doing what Dean the Vaping Biker and Todd done and at the end of next year saying to uh, saying to eSig Click remove my name from the awards because I think it's about time other reviewers got the chance to get that top spot but <laughs> there's that little voice in the background saying go on Vic make it five in a row go on make it five in a row then you can have your name there's that little voice at the back of my head saying it make it five in a row Vic Five in a row, half a decade, go on. I don't know, I don't know. Um, I think it is, I th I, the way I'm thinking now, the way I'm thinking now, I think it is time for other reviewers to get a chance to get that number one spot. Um, 
That's the way I'm thinking right now. Whether I still think that way come December 2020, if that little voice at the back of my head is now saying, yeah, go on, fucking five in a row, Vic, five in a row. But we'll find out at the end of 2020. But right now, I'm thinking, yeah, this this may be the last e-cyclic Click award I'll get. Uh, it may be. I don't know yet, though. Uh, because the gap, just the gap between first and second... That was like a twenty percent. It was like a twenty percentage point gap. Um, vaping with Vic is hoovering up a lot of the votes, and yeah, we'll, we'll see how I'm feeling. Put it that way, we'll see how I'm feeling. But a massive thanks to everyone that did vote for me. That's four years in a row. Four in a row. Vaping with Vic has got the e-cig click. Dot co dot uk award i don't think guide to vaping <laughs> remember that debacle last year i don't think guide to vaping's having their contest this year i looked at their website and there's no sign of them doing a vote um for a best off poll they might do it in january but i don't know yet anyway let's move on to that was the year that was 2019 i said this on scuba steve's show um early saturday morning my time 2018 is when we all boarded the RMS Titanic, not realising it was the Titanic. 2019, especially the back half of 2019, is when we were all on the deck having a dance and vaping, and all of a sudden from the crow's nest up above you hear a sailor shouting, Iceberg! Right ahead! 2020 is when the RMS Titanic hits the iceberg. More about 2020 at the back half of this video though but what for now what we're going to talk about is 2019 2019 turned into a repeat of the back end of 2018 let's be honest here folks now i did say um at the that was the year that was 2018 video that there is a big chance a very big chance that the pod market will collapse during 2019 and it did it fell apart round about August, September of this year. That's when you started to notice a decisive shift in what some of these pod companies were doing, especially companies like, especially companies like, um, uh, not so much Aspire, because they were doing AIOs, then they came out with the pod, but companies that were known for making mods, like dual battery box mods, like Lost Vape, for instance, they went up to their fucking necks, up to their necks in the pod market, and look what happened to them. It was pod, cheap pod, pod, cheap pod, pod, bookend. They got the same pod system, ripped out the arse of the pod, and shoved a stock coil inside, and now it's an AIO. And that's 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 exactly what they've done with the latest one. From, the Lost Vapor Ryan Q Plus or something? It's the Lost Vapor Ryan Q with a stock coil shoved up the rear end of the pod. That's all it is. It's an AIO system now. And Lost Vape's not the only company that done that. There was a lot of other pod companies out there that seen the way the market was starting to decline for pods as early as the end of August. As early as the end of August. And decided by the end of 2019, they're basically going to turn their backs on the pod market. And that's exactly what a lot of these companies did. They went knee deep in the AIO market. Knee deep in it. Um, which I think is going to come back and bite them in the rear end in 2020. But the fact is, the pod market has collapsed. There's no getting around it. There is still a handful of companies out there that are still releasing new pods, but those companies are seeing a major downturn in the sales figures for their pod kits compared to other companies that released their pods at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And there's one simple reason for it. There's too fucking many of them. There is the, the, there's oversaturation and there's taking the piss and the, the e-cig industry is up there now with taking the piss out of the pod market saturation. Um, that's why the pod markets, that's why the pod markets essentially collapsed. Um, I, this year alone, I must have refused just under 40 different companies. Just under 40. That's more than two emails a month 
uh, I must have refused more than 40 different companies with reviews for their podcasts because either, number one, they were using the uh, they were using the Felum pod technology, so it was pointless reviewing that because I've already reviewed three or four Felum based pod based kits out there, and it's pointless reviewing more. On number two, they're using a rebranded Hexa. That's the way the market started going. OEM. Uh, OEM manufacturing for the, the Felum Tech and the Hexapod systems. Now, the Hexapod systems are kind of the same as the Felum Tech system as well, because from what I remember, the, the, the Hexapod is using the Mark I version of the Felum Tech pods. <laughs> like, if there's one company out there making a fortune in the pod industry, it's got to be Felum Tech. They must be raking it in. The amount of rebranded pod systems that are based off the Felum system that are under other brand names, that's why I turned them down. Um, because if if I had accepted um, the review of that pod, and in some cases accepted the bribe, because that's that's the stage it got to for... I'm not fucking kidding. That's the fucking stage it got to. Some of these companies were so desperate to have the name of their pod out there, they were willing to throw £500, £600. One company even offered £1,000, not dollars, pounds, for me to do the review. And I was like, no. Fuck me, no. Um, don't, don't get me wrong, I was tempted, especially the $1,000, the £1,000, I was fucking tempted for about two seconds, and then I thought to myself, hold on, Vic, what the fuck are you doing here? This company is bribing you to do a review. No. Fuck off. That was sort of the reply I sent back to them. But yeah, the pod market crashed. And at the last count, I think it's about 11 companies in Shenzhen in China where a lot of these pod systems are being manufactured. About 11 companies that were solely based on the pod market they went bankrupt last month. They literally shut down last month. Um, I got a couple of emails from their old from their old PR people saying, "I've left the job, Vic. Nice working with you. The company's now shut down due to lack of sales." At least two emails, but at least eleven companies went belly up last month in Shenzhen in China. And what you're probably going to see as we get into Chinese New Year, which is the end of January 2020 as a whole load of other pod-based manufacturers shutting shop during the Chinese New Year, which happens a lot, actually, to be honest, but more about that when we get to the 2020 side of things. So they went from pods and they went to AIOs, but here's the problem with the all-in-one system. The all-in-one system is a cul-de-sac. It's a dead end. It's not a road that you can continuously travel down that will have options of other innovative ideas or options of other innovative airflow systems because an AIO is inherently locked into its own AIO system. When you release an AIO rebuildable, right, whether it's something like the Geek Vape Boost rebuildable section that you can buy separately, that's it. Where can you go after that? You can't go anywhere after that, because here's the thing. With that rebuildable head, you're locked in place with the mod that goes with the rebuildable head. It's not a 510 connection system. It's not. So you're limited to what you can do with that rebuildable head because of the power that the AIO mod is willing to give you. The AIO systems are a dead end. They are an absolute dead end in the industry. Why do you think the originator of the AIO mainstream system, Joytech, stopped making them. This isn't the first merry-go-round, or this isn't the first go in the merry-go-round that people have had, that vapors have had for AIOs. Joytech did it first. A long time ago with the Ego AIO systems that they released midway through 2016. Why do you think Joytech stopped making them? Because Joytech ran into that cul-de-sac and couldn't find a way back out. So the AIO systems from Joytech ceased to be. 
they stopped doing them in 2018. They're doing them now, though, because the AIO systems are back, but companies are going to find that as we get further into 2020, that cul-de-sac is going to become very apparent because they can't really update the rebuildable head to take bigger coils if the AIO mod that the rebuildable head is locked into is incapable of supplying the power needed to make those big coils work. AIOs are a dead end. They've always been a dead end, just like the pod systems are a dead end. But the thing is, the AIO systems are going to be a much quicker dead end because you're seeing it right now. The AIOs are already coming out with rebuildable heads, like the Geek Vape, uh, the Geek Vape rebuildable head for the boost. And there's a couple of other companies out there that are releasing rebuildable heads right after New Year. And the AIO merry-go-round has only really been spinning for the past four months. The AIO market's going to collapse spectacularly in spring of 2020. You're looking at a half run compared to the pod run. You're looking at half that time for the AIO market to collapse. It will collapse by around about April. I'm, I'm going for April. Just before the expo in May. I'm going for April. That's when the pod market will spectacularly fall apart. So, we've had the pods. We've had the AIOs. What's next? Or what also cropped up in 2019? 2019. The main saving grace for 2019 was the fact that a lot of reviewers got involved in the making of RTAs and RDAs, and in some cases, mods. If you take Mike Vapes, Matt Cully, suck my mod, Bogan, Mr. Just Right One, if you take all of their names out of the equation and all of the items they designed out of the equation, 2019 would have been a very, very barren year for rebuildables. Think about it. Mike Vapes is responsible for some of the best rebuildable tanks and rebuildable drippers that got released in 2019. Matt Cully with the passage, Mr. Just Right Run with the whole mesh thing that he went off to do. Bogan, especially with the blotto that Bogan, that Bogan designed at the end of this year. To a certain extent, myself with the Kelpie, even though the Kelpie never made it all that big in the United States because EH Pro's a small company, but over here in the UK and the EU, the Kelpie was quite a big release. For EH Pro. If it wasn't for the reviewers pushing companies like Watofo, who are now owned by Smock, more about that later on, but pushing companies like Watofo, pushing companies like Ogvate, and pushing other companies out there. Uh, another example, um, Alex from Vapors MD with the Berserker range, you would see a major lack of rebuildables in the market for electronic cigarettes. Because the fact is, a lot of these companies out there, like Vandevape, like Watofo, and like Ogvape, for instance, they ran out of ideas. They literally ran out of ideas because 2017 and going into the beginning of 2018, before the pod systems hit the market, these companies like Vandevape were releasing tank after tank after tank after dripper after dripper after dripper. And their designers ran out of ideas because they had flooded the market with RTAs. So they got the reviewers on board to come up with fresh ideas. And if it wasn't for the reviewers, like Mike Vapes, uh, like Mike Vapes, like Mr. Just Right One, like Alex from Vapors MD to a, le to a much lesser extent with the Kelpie, like myself, you would have not seen the amount of RTAs and RDAs that we seen in 2019. Sorry. It would have all been pods and AIOs with the occasional dual battery box mod with a stock coil sub ohm tank chucked in the box. A smock special, in other words. 2019 was a very interesting year. Uh, very interesting year. It also showed, especially once the problems in the United States reared its ugly head, it also showed that Shenzhen and China are a little bit more cautious with what they're doing for the future of vaping. The Damocles sword that is resting on that single thread of hair above the vaping industry in the United States is going to haunt 
the United States industry for months to come. More about that when we hit the 2020 subject. But as we've seen with all the bans that went on in the United States, it does have a knock-on effect. It does have a knock-on effect, even though it is the case that the United States is no longer the top-ranking country for profit margins to do with electronic cigarettes in Shenzhen in China. That now goes to that now goes to the EU and to Russia, especially to Russia. Russia's a country that we all seem to forget about when it comes to vaping, but vaping has absolutely took off over there. It's absolutely blew up. That's the wrong analogy to use. It's absolutely took off over in Russia as vapors are now in the millions millions some are saying there's there's no concrete concrete numbers but some are saying the number of vapors in russia will will surpass the number of vapors in the united states at the end of 2020 russia the european union and to a lesser extent the uk once we leave the european union are now shenzhen and china's biggest markets the united states market's been on a steady and slow very slow decline for the past couple of years. But when these bans started happening, that decline, slow decline, has now turned into a very steep decline as more and more vape shops were forced to close because of stupid bans by ill-informed governors that should never be voted back into a position of power again. And as those vape shops closed, the wholesalers had no one to stock. So the wholesalers, on the local side at least, they started to go bankrupt as well. And Shenzhen in China, companies like Geek Vape, Smok, Watofo, Aspire, they were finding their takings dramatically falling in the United States over the past four months. That's what happened. The end, or the back half, should I say, the back half of 2019 is a nightmare for people in the United States. An absolute royal nightmare. Um with the bans that have went on now, with T21 being passed on a federal level. So all those vapors out there aged 18, 19 or 20, what's going to happen to them? Because technically speaking, it's now illegal for them to buy vape products, even though less than a month ago, it was legal for them to buy it. So what are they going to do? Go back to smoking? It's a shit show. The whole thing's a shit show over in the United States. Uh, we also seen with the collapse of vaping in the United States, we seen a lot of companies turning their eyes away from United States expos and concentrating on expos either in the Middle East or in Europe or in the United Kingdom. Classic example. The Vapor Expo that went on in October in the UK was a marked difference to previous October Expos in the UK. The big difference was the fact there was a lot more hardware there. And some of those booths, when I was chatting to them, some of those booths were saying, with the problems that are happening in the United States, we simply decided not to go to US Expos because we don't even know if the US Expos are even going to be on in October, November or December, let alone what's happening at the beginning of 2020. So we decided to concentrate on the UK and EU markets. This is why the UK Vapor Expo, and more especially the Hall of Vape in Germany, are going to become the biggest expos on the planet. With the possible exception of that expo that's happening in Dubai, which I'm not going to go to because it's going to be too fucking, too fucking expensive. But yeah, you're looking, you're going to be looking at the two biggest expos on the planet, the UK Vapor Expo and the Hall of Vape in Stuttgart in Germany. Um, especially because the expo scene in the United States basically doesn't exist anymore. It, it just doesn't exist anymore. It simply doesn't. Uh, so with all this going on, we're now reaching the end of 2019, which has been a very mixed year, very mixed year, in terms of what was available on the market for people to vape on, and in terms of the market strategies 
that a lot of these vape companies in Shenzhen and China were hedging their bet on. You are going to see changes happening in 2020. And a lot of those changes are going to be a direct result of what happened this year in 2019. A lot of those changes are because of that. Because the pod system, because the pod market, and now the AIO market was so heavily invested into by a lot of these larger companies in Shenzhen and China, their normal markets, which is like dual battery box mods and rebuildables, their normal markets have taken a hammering because they pushed the whole pod scene as much as they possibly could. And now the market is oversaturated with pods. The stock that they have left and I know a couple of companies in Shenzhen and China that have got quarter of a million to half a million units of pod kits sitting in their warehouse that they cannot get rid of. I'm not going to mention the company's names, but they're both pretty big companies. They have to be pretty big companies to swallow the loss of all of that stock sitting there that they can't get rid of. That's how oversaturated the pod market's become. Uh, the back end of 2019 is a nightmare. Um, especially if you are in the United States. But as we leave the year of 2019, which can basically be summed up in... Uh, it can basically be summed up in six letters. P-O-D-A-I-O. That's how you can sum up 2019, with a little spattering of decent rebuildables in between, but it's, this was the year of the pod and the AIO. As we leave 2019 and move into 2020, things that will happen in 2020 will have serious ramifications for 2021. Jump cut! Yeah, it's actually the next day. Um, so, I was reviewing the footage and I'd, I'd split the segments into two, the 2019 and 2020, so I can have a little break in the middle to rest the voice and the 2020 half, all the audio was out of sync, like fucking everything was out of fucking sync and this mic is running through Audacity, which is what I used to record all the audio and for some reason Audacity didn't record the audio at the same time but what's the word I'm looking for? At the same speed, I suppose, that the audio on the camera was recorded at. So instead of fucking spending hours stretching and stretching and squishing video and fucking film and all the rest of it to try and get the time syncs to line up, fuck it, I'll record that again. So that's exactly what I'm doing. So <clears throat> we've basically covered 2019. Um... The first half of 2019 was pods and AIOs, well, pods. Second half of 2019 was AIOs, and then the shit show that happened over in the United States. And the United States is going to feature very, very prominently for the entire industry as we go into 2020. So, at the end of 2019, <clears throat> going into the year 2020, what does it look like for the vaping scene as we move into the new year. There is a number of things happening that have accumulated over the past couple of years that are starting to raise their ugly heads and they all happen to be happening next year. Next year. First thing we're going to talk about is the e-liquid industry. There is going to be major shifts happening in the e-liquid industry at the back half of 2020. Um, normally in the week between Christmas and New Year, I generally tend to catch up with some old friends who are basically industry insiders. They work in the industry, either as wholesalers on the e-liquid or hardware side, <clears throat> either in the e-liquid industry itself or in the hardware industry. And a lot of these folks that are working in the industry have all came back and said roughly the same thing. The industry as we know it right now is going to change drastically within five years. A handful of those people that I talk to, three people in particular, actually I'm not going to mention their names obviously, but three people in particular who all work <coughs> in 
and around the e-liquid industry have said that five-year thing is not going to happen. It's going to be two years. It's going to be two years. So what's going to change before this point in time in 2021? You're going to see the first signs of it happening in 2020. In fact, to be honest, the first signs of it happening has already happened. It's just It just wasn't reported on in the news. Because everyone concentrates on the hardware side of things and the advocacy side of things, we all generally tend to ignore the e-liquid industry. So, you walk in to your favourite vape shop and you're seeing... If it's a big vape shop, you're probably seeing 20 to 30 different brands of e-liquid on the store shelves, right? <coughs> so you've got all these different brands of e-liquid, all with their colourful labels, and one of those brands is your favourite, right? Imagine the scenario that happened in the very early part of the 1950s with the tobacco industry. You could walk into a tobacconist shop any tobacco in a shop, and there was loads of them back in the 50s, especially the early 50s, straight after the Second World War. You could walk into a tobacco in a shop and you can order a Perique or a Latakia or a short, medium or long flu cure Virginia. You can pick and choose which type of Virginia cured leaf you wanted. If you wanted a smoke cured, you can get the smoke cured. If you wanted a flu cured, you can get the flu cured. If you wanted a dry sun cured, you can get a dry sun cured. Whatever tobacco cured leaf and whatever genus of leaf you wanted, nine times out of ten, a tobacco in a shop stocked it. So what happened in the decade leading up to the 1960s? Because if you look at the 1960s, within 10 years, everything changed. You were no longer able to buy loose leaf because practically 95% of the tobacconist shops, gone. They just vanished. Not only in the UK, but also in the United States. What happened in that span of a decade? The weak point was taken over. Every production run everything. Doesn't matter what you're talking about here. You could be talking about the production run of a car. And when I'm talking about the production run, I'm talking about the acquisition of the parts, the assembly of the parts, the final finishing, and then the road to the distributor. In other words, the car dealer. The whole production run. Every production point has a weak point. Every one of them. Doesn't matter what industry you're talking about here. For the tobacco industry, especially in the early, early 1950s, late 1940s, just after the Second World War, that production run weak point was the processing plants. The big tobacco companies, American Tobacco, British Tobacco, they were called something different back then, but they merged to become British American Tobacco in the late 1960s. But back then, they were separate entities working in Britain and working over in the United States. Because we need to remember the, <coughs> the, the, the roaring 20s, the 30s and the 40s going into the 50s, the UK was one of the big players in the tobacco industry, taking care of the UK and what was continental Europe and a little bit of Russia. America, the American tobacco companies, took care, took care of America, South America, and Canada. So there was a split down the Atlantic between the two different visions of what tobacco should actually be. <clears throat> and it was the American side that done it first. In the very early 1950s, American tobacco, along with the forerunner of Reynolds, realised that there is a weak point in the production flow. There's a weak point, and that weak point was open to anyone to take over, and it was the production and processing facility. When a tobacco leaf is picked, that's not the end of the story. That tobacco leaf now has to be washed and cleaned, usually with clean cold water, or in some in some cases, especially for the uh, Latakia, Latakia cure process, it's actually kind of partially blanched, it's, it gets dipped into s almost boiling water to speed up the fermentation process quicker for the Latakia process, but mostly it's washed with cold water, right? And then that leaf is then transported to 
that leaf is then transported to whatever segment of the production facility it needs to go to. In the case of straight golden Virginia, for instance, it's usually hung up in a flue and cured. It's dried out. For some of the stronger, darker blends of Virginia, like pipe tobacco, for instance, it's generally left out in the sun to dry. These production facilities for tobacco leaves are massive. They cover acres and acres of land. And in the late 1940s, they were all operated and owned independently from the tobacco company. The tobacco company was responsible at that point in time. The tobacco company was responsible for two things. The picking of the leaf and the sale of the leaf. The middle point, which is the weak point in the process, was down to the individual independent processing facilities. American tobacco companies were the first to do it. What started happening in the late 1940s and early 1950s is all these independent tobacco processing plants were essentially bought up by the tobacco companies and the birth of big tobacco started to happen. There was a five-year lag between it happening in the United States and the UK, but eventually British tobacco companies started doing the same thing. The processing facilities in the south of England, while they, while they were there, were all taken over by, by British tobacco firms. And what happened is in the space of half a decade, <coughs> from 1955 to the very early 1960s, what started to happen was when these independent processing facilities started to be gobbled up by big tobacco or the forerunner of big tobacco firms these tobacco firms realized they could alter the market by doing two things number one they now own the processing plant that serves half a dozen companies apart from their own company they had two choices with that they could either raise the price to get more money in from the third parties or simply ban other companies from using their facilities. Number two, because they owned the facility, they could steer their market in a different direction by cutting costs, by getting rid of the Latakia and the Perique cure process, by getting rid of the long cure flu process, scaling down the operation and making more money. And those two points, they knocked out the competition and they increased profits. That's why, within half a decade, over 90% of the tobacconist shops in the United States vanished. It was also the rise of the supermarket era as well. That kind of killed off the tobacconist shops too. But the same thing happened here in the UK. All these tobacconist shops slowly vanished because... In the mid-1960s, the last of the independent tobacco processing plants were taken over by the brand new British American Tobacco. The same thing is now happening in the e-liquid industry. You've got hundreds, literally hundreds of e-liquid brands. And in the case of the bigger brands like 12 Monkeys, for instance, they probably have their, in fact, they don't probably, they do have their own independent, small-scale processing facility. But for about 70% of the e-liquid industry as a whole, they don't have the money to shell out for an ISO-certified lab and processing facility. So they go to the third-party processing plants. 70% of the e-liquid industry on this planet is relying on a handful of processing plants in the United States, in Europe, and now in the UK. There's your weak point, right there. Now, we've already seen this happening. Altria have taken a big stake in Molecule Labs.
and Molecule Labs at the time was responsible for round about 50 to 60 percent of the e-liquid manufacturing in the United States. When Molecule Labs got taken over by Altria, everyone panicked, told Molecule Labs to fuck off, and they went to other independent uh, independent juice mixing and mixing facilities in the United States. But if you look at what's been happening in the e-liquid industry since Molecule Labs takeover, it's still happening. It's still happening. Two independent mixing facilities in the United States was taken over, one of them by an umbrella corporation, and the other one was taken over, or failed to be taken over, sorry, by a conglomerate of e-liquid companies. Now, with the problems that's happening in the United States right now, with shop after shop after shop closing, with wholesalers and distributors on the verge of bankruptcy, and more especially with e-liquid companies on the verge of bankruptcy, these processing facilities are now ripe for the taking. Out of the people that I spoke to <coughs> on Instagram, and on Facebook Messenger. Three of these people worked in the e-liquid, and well, not worked, work in the e-liquid, they're still working in it. They all said the five-year thing is bullshit, Vic. It's going to happen within two years. So at the very beginning of this, I said, walk into your local vape shop, and you've got, if it's a good vape shop, you've got like 20 to 30 different brands of e-liquid. And all of those 20 to 30 different brands of e-liquid have got their individual company owners. So 20 to 30 brands, you're probably talking about 15 to 20 companies responsible for those 25 brands because again, some e-liquid companies like 12 Monkeys for instance has two or three different brand names under their umbrella. Some of these outlets, some of these e-liquid people that work in the industry were saying to me, if you walk into that same shop, Vic, by Christmas of 2021, those 20 to 30 e-liquid brands are going to be owned by five companies. And it's already starting to happen. You've got the bigger e-liquid companies like IVG that are throwing their weight around something bad when it comes to the marketing and silencing of smaller e-liquid companies in the UK. You've got other larger e-liquid brands over in the United States who are now taking a very aggressive approach to trying to take over the production facilities and mixing facilities for e-liquids. So those independent production facilities that the 50 to 60% of smaller companies are relying on are gone. Those smaller companies start to go belly up, the bigger company swoops in, buys that company out and keeps that brand going under their own company. It's the same trick that Big Tobacco started to use in the US in the early 50s, and it's the same trick that Big Tobacco started to use here in the UK in the mid-1960s. Take out the weakest point of the production line and you bankrupt the competition. Just as the competition starts to go bankrupt, you take over their company and keep their brand name. And all the profits goes to you. The e-liquid industry is now heading down the exact same road. And I heard this from three separate individuals now. One of these individuals I'm very close friends with, I talk to on a semi-regular basis. The other two folks, I generally only tend to talk to them when it's a holiday because they're usually too busy. But all three of them came up with roughly the same premise, that same story of walking in to your favourite vape shop and the 20 to 25 brands sitting on the shelf by Christmas of 2021 will all be owned by five big companies. You're looking at the birth of big e-liquid. There's, there's no other way around it, folks. You are now at the threshold of looking at the birth of big e-liquid. And here's the thing. There's nothing we can do to stop it. I'm going to say it right now. There is nothing we can do to stop it from happening because it's already starting to happen and has been starting to happen all the way through 2019. It just wasn't reported on. It wasn't reported on by anyone because here's the thing. You walk into an e-liquid 
uh, not not an e-liquid company. You walk into a, a vapor expo, right? You walk into an expo either in the United States when they still had them, or here in the UK, and you see a multitude of e-liquid brands, and you think, well, the e-liquid industry must be going quite well. Look at all these new companies popping up. Scratch beneath the surface and find out who owns the company. It's not a new brand. It's probably an old brand that we all thought was gone that's been relabeled and taken over by another company. And it's been going on for at least two years now. 2020, next year, we are going to see this becoming public knowledge because we will start to see larger e-liquid companies publicly announce that, hey, such and such a brand that everyone loves, we've just taken them over. You can still buy these on your local vape shop shelf. The problem here is, as more and more brands get taken over by fewer and fewer companies, the same thing happened, the same thing that happened in the tobacco industry will happen in the e-liquid industry. Price fixing. It's already going on. Wholesalers don't want to talk about it, distributors don't want to talk about it, but price fixing is already going on in the e-liquid market, and has been for at least the past year and a half. It's all hush-hush, we don't talk about it, but it's there. It will become even more apparent as less and less, or sorry, as more and more of the different individual brands are owned by only a handful of companies. Those handful of companies will do the same trick that Big Tobacco done in the 1970s. Price fixing. They will fix the price and pin it to that price. And that fixed price will go up or down with inflation depending on what country you happen to live in. You will see the price of e-liquid go up. Because with less companies owning the bigger pool of brands, those big companies can start to get away with practically anything they want to do. Big Tobacco got away with it, Big E-Liquid will get away with it as well. So, that's the first front of what's going to turn in to a four-front battle. What's the second front? Now, the second front is an if but this second front has very, very serious ramifications for 2020 with the final two fronts that we may be fighting as well. This is a four-front war. We're entering a four-front war. The first front is the conglomeration and amalgamation of the e-liquid business. The second front is the PMTA in the United States of America that may or may not happen in May of next year. I'm still of the firm belief that the FD is going to push back that uh, push back that PMTA process for another two years. But if they don't, what's going to happen? Well, for the people outside the United States, the PMTA is the pre-market tobacco application. Because like the EU, the US decided to bundle up e-cigs in the same category as tobacco. And the PMTA process is very simple. Any e-cigarette product that has been made or released and I think the cutoff date was 2010. Somebody will correct me down in the comments, but I think the cutoff date was 2000. Was it 2010 or 2016? It was like the way it, the way it works is <clears throat> any e liquid or hardware that's been made after a certain point in time has to go through the PMTA process. So, let's say a new e liquid line was launched by an e liquid company last year they have to put that full e-liquid line through the PMTA process. But here's the problem. For one single e-liquid, one e-liquid flavouring, at one milligram strength, not actually one milligram, but one separate milligram strength, it will cost the e-liquid company upwards of $100,000 to put it through the PMTA. And in some cases, maybe even half a million US dollars. Can you honestly see some of the smaller e-liquid companies in the US being able to afford that? Especially if they've got a range of 60 to 100 e-liquids. That's 60 times 100,000. Or 60 times half a million. Then you've got the hardware side of it. If the hardware side is brought into the PMTA, what you're basically looking at is forgetting the cutoff point. If it was to happen from May forwards, any new release 
from GeekVape, from Smock, from any of the big Shenzhen companies, including companies within the United States, they have to put that hardware through the PMTA process as well. If they don't put it through the PMTA process, along with e-liquids, it is illegal to sell it in the United States. Even if the PMTA process was to be activated from that date in May, grandfathering in everything in before it, it will still collapse the US vaping industry. It won't stunt it, it will collapse it. Because what basically happens then is it's a case of here you go, vapors, you can vape anything that's been released up to May of this year, but see all that new shiny stuff you see on Facebook and on Instagram, while Instagram still allows it, and on Twitter, sorry, you can't buy it until it goes through the PMTA process. There is 50% of the market share for Shenzhen in China. Gone. Just gone. Because having to submit a PMTA for every single tank Every single mod, every single stock coil tank, every single kit, every single bit of hardware is going to cost Shenzhen a fucking fortune, especially considering the amount of products that they release every year. So if the PMTA goes ahead, you will see the immediate collapse of the US market. The immediate collapse. Vape shops that have not been shut down because of the bans, they will still be able to trade if... And only if everything before May of 2020 is grandfathered in. But the way the PMT has been written right now, it's not being grandfathered in. And the cutoff date is some stupid year from years back where all the e-cig stuff was shit. That's what the US is facing right now. And if the PMTA goes ahead, it will have massive repercussions, fucking huge repercussions. Not just for the United States, but for vapors across the planet. Because the first place to be hit will be Shenzhen in China. That's the first place that will be hit. And that's why we're moving on to the third front of this war. If the PMTA takes place, you will see the consolidation of e-cigarette e businesses in Shenzhen in China. You will see the partial collapse of the e-cigarette industry in China as well. The first signs already started to happen due to the bans that were taking place over in the United States. Because here's the thing. Some companies like Watofo, for instance, we're picking in Watofo here for a reason, by the way. Some companies like Watofo relied on the US market because all of the marketing budget was pushed to the United States. Watofo didn't ignore Russia, UK and Europe, but they preferred to market more towards the United States. When these state bans started happening, when vape shops after vape shop after vape shop started shutting down and going bankrupt, when wholesalers and distributors stopped putting orders in, Watofo had a big problem. They were on the verge of bankruptcy. Two and a half months ago, Smock took over Watofo. In case you didn't know, Watofo is now wholly owned by Smock Tech. The same Smock that released cat after cat after cat after cat after tank after tank after tank. They now own Watofo. They own the brand, the whole brand. They just took over the company, lock stock and two smoking barrels. Watofo is still there, it's still the Watofo that we all recognised. It's just owned by Smock now. If the PMT process goes ahead, the consolidation of the e-liquid industry in Shenzhen and China is going to happen at the back half of 2020. Shenzhen will not have a choice. They will have to do it. Especially for companies like Watofo that pushed the US market to the detriment of the UK, Russian and EU market. On the flip side of that coin as well, what you're starting to see, and I've noticed it as well, especially over the past month and a half, if you look closely at the marketing strategies by the likes of GeekVape or Aspire, you're noticing a very subtle change in the way that these companies market and the imagery that these companies use. Geek Vape are shifting away 
from pushing the US market and they're now marketing to the much more, well, not much more, but the slightly more reserved attitudes in Russia, in Europe, and in the UK. Look at the marketing that's been going on now for the past month and a half to two months, ever since the problems happened over in the United States. And you'll see that companies like GeekVape and Aspire are now shifting their attention away from the US and towards continental Europe and the UK and Russia, because that is going to be the countries and areas that will save the vaping industry in Shenzhen and China again if the PMTA happens. The whole thing rests on May of 2020, but you're starting to see it now. If the PMTA goes ahead, PMTA goes ahead by the end of 2020, smock will probably be one of slightly more than a handful of companies that will still be standing if the PMTA goes ahead. Because if the PMTA goes ahead, all these smaller companies that are pushing the United States market, they're gone. They are gone. They have got no way to survive. And it's far too late in the game now to shift your marketing to the United to the United Kingdom and the EU and Russia if you've been pouring hundreds of thousands of US dollars to the marketing campaigns for the United States. It's too late to do it. They've ran out of money. They will go belly up and smock, aspire, geek vape, vandy vape, joy tech, probably Asmodis as well, will hoover up all the smaller companies that are going belly up. The same thing that's going to happen in the e-liquid industry will happen in the hardware industry. What we are looking at is the consolidation and conglomeration of both wings of the vaping industry. The e-liquid wing and the hardware wing. But for the hardware side of things, it all rests on the PMTA. If the PMTA doesn't happen and the only thing left for the United States vapors to fight is the state ban after state ban after state ban, the US market will still technically be an open market and you will not see the consolidation of the e-cigarette industry in Shenzhen and China. There will still be some companies that will go bust. But those companies will be hoovered up by the likes of Smock anyway. But for all intents and purposes, if the PMTA doesn't happen, nothing much will change over in Shenzhen. If it does happen, it will have massive repercussions for everyone else. It will. That's the third front we're looking at for 2020. The fourth front is for people in the European Union. Not so much for the UK, because we are saying bye-bye to the EU by the end of January. But for people in the European Union, 2020 is the year that the TPD gets redrawn. TPD 3 is being called because technically we're actually under TPD 2 right now because the original TPD was never ratified so they had to redraw the white paper and rename it TPD 2. We're under TPD 2 right now. TPD 3 is being written up by the end of 2020 and there is elements of the European Commission that want to go down the same road that some states have went down in the United States. They want to ban flavours. They want to severely limit the choice of products. And the same old argument that cropped up in 2014 and 2015 of some of these elements of the European bureaucracy saying, oh, oh, we can't have our citizens handling loose batteries, all, all external battery devices, we should just ban them. The citizenry doesn't need to use those. They can just use ones with inbuilt batteries. There's no difference anyway. Exact words of one of these European ball sacks. There is no difference anyway between external battery mods and internal LiPo mods. Oh, they're all the same. That's what the European Union is currently facing now. Am I saying that the TPD3 will be 10 times worse than the TPD2? No, I'm not. Because there is still elements within the European community that look at vaping as a good way for people to give up smoking. The problem happening in Europe right now is 
they're looking at what's happening in the United States. And a lot of the brainless, lobotomized, knuckle-dragging fuckheads over in Europe are believing every single word coming from the states over in the United States that's saying, Oh, vaping, think of the children! Ban everything! Some of these European idiots are fucking believing it, hook, line and sinker. Again, the United States is affecting the entire industry. Now, I still think that the TPD-3 will not be worse than the TPD-2. Because you will have elements like the new Nicotine Alliance who will be going over to Brussels and fighting for the rights of vapours. And then there's one other thing we need to remember here. The Germans. When the UK leaves at the end of January, when we leave the European Union, Germany will basically run the European Union. They practically were already anyway, but the UK was there as a kind of veto measure to kind of block Germany from just running roughshod over the entire parliamentary process of the European democracy. But, you know, with with Germany there, there is several things German vapors like. Big, high-capacity tanks. The Brunhilde, the Steam Crave range. Big, high-wattage mods that take more than two batteries. Big stacked mechanical mods that take more than two batteries. This is all. This is literally all I seen when me and Chris Empire and when me Chris Empire and uh, Lena Cookie went over to Germany this year. That's all you seen. Fucking mechs, stacked mechs that were literally this tall, triple quad stack mechs. Um, the Titan tank from Steam Crave sitting on top of the Titan mod. There was literally hundreds of people using the Titan tanks walking around in Stuttgart. If they weren't using stacked insane mechs, they were using 20 to 60 mil capacity tanks. And I even seen one Steam Crave tank that was modified by the user to increase the capacity, get this, to 85 mil. The fucking tank was about this fucking tall and he basically got a hundred mil bottle and almost emptied it. He just went, <laughs> he almost emptied it into the tank. This is the things that a lot of German hobbyist vapors like to do. They love the high capacity tanks, the high amperage draw, triple or quadruple battery mods, the stacked triple or quadruple mechs. They love all that stuff. If it all gets banned by the European Union, there would probably be riots. I'm just saying it fucking now. There would probably be riots in Germany, considering the way that the German market has veered away from the TPD, completely away from it. Germany was the first country to drop the 2 mil capacity limit on tanks. They just went, see that 2 mil thing? Get to fuck. They just scratched it. If the TPD-3 ends up limiting German vapor's choices. If the TPD-3 ends up curtailing German vapor's choices, there will be riots on the street. Because some of those German vapors are scary. I'm, I'm saying it now. Some of them look scary. You know, they, they looked, it's like fucking piercings and big beards and... Uh, they looked scary. So, yeah. Um... <laughs> I honestly do not think that the TPD-3 will have any major detrimental effect to vaping in the European Union. Not if Germany can have anything to do with it. Because we need to remember, by the point in time that the European Commission will be sitting down to hammer out the TPD-3, the UK will have left. Bye-bye. There's us over there doing our own thing and making up our own laws away from this TPD shit that you forced down our fucking throat. So it's up to Germany. It is literally up to Germany. Um, I hope that the NNA can start to work with a lot of the German advocacy groups to meet up at Brussels and sit down and talk to the European commissioners as they hammer out the new deal for the TPD. Germany has to be there. Some kind some kind of 
some kind of advocacy link up between the NNA and some of the advocacy groups and they have to be there to show the way that the German vapors have veered off away from the TPD and they've now got a flourishing vaping economy there. If Germany's not there, things might go down a darker path. They might go down a darker path. The elements of the European Commission that want to see vaping gone may end up winning or having a partial win by crippling a large segment of the vaping industry in the EU. That, folks, is the forefront war that we are facing in 2020. The consolidation of the e-liquid industry, too late to do anything about that. It's already starting to happen. The PMTA in May. If the PMTA in May takes place, the consolidation of the e-cigarette hardware industry in Shenzhen in China, which will have a knock-on effect across the planet, and more especially for people in the European Union, not for us in the UK, because we're gone by that point in time, TPD3. And all of it is happening next year. All of it. It's like one bad thing fucking stacked on top of another. And on top of that, it gets fucking better, folks. Although this won't really affect people watching the video, but it will affect people that make vaping-related content on social media. YouTube's new terms of service drops on January the 1st. And, oh boy. Ho, ho. Now. Uh, <sighs> so far, there's been no sign of YouTube giving it fucking vapors. Fuck you. There's been no sign of that happening, right? But the new terms of service is pushing the whole drugs thing, you know. And technically speaking, nicotine is a drug. It's a drug, right? Technically speaking. But so is caffeine. And nicotine is no more toxic than caffeine is. You die of a nicotine overdose. You die of a caffeine overdose after bouncing off the walls for several hours, but you still die of a caffeine overdose. Now, YouTube are now pushing the new terms of service and community guidelines from January the 1st of this year. And the new community guidelines and the new terms of service has got a big thing in there about harassment. Harassment. It's just an, an overall blurred heading of harassment is no longer allowed on YouTube. So you're going to see certain YouTube channels... If they keep doing what they've been doing for the past year, they're gone. YouTube will shut them down. And it's already starting to happen within certain segments of other genres in the YouTube platform. YouTube have already deleted over 25,000 channels over the past month and a half. And they haven't even implemented the terms of service yet. The deletions that are going on right now is to do with the, the, the terms of service change that happened on December the 10th. The one about YouTube doesn't need to host your videos if we don't want to. And the other one about YouTube can shut your channel down if you're not, ec what is it? If you're not monetarily viable or some shit like that. They've already started the purge. They've started the purge already. Can you imagine what's going to happen when that new toss change happens in January the 1st? Just under the harassment heading? There is some e-cig reviewers out there that are going to have to be very careful from January the 1st onwards. But here's the thing. YouTube don't do it from that date onwards. Once the terms of service takes place, they do it retroactively as well. They do it retroactively. So all the videos that come out previously will technically have to fall under that harassment law. And the copper change that's coming as well. Which... Well, yeah, the copper change is also January the 1st. That's another fucking shit show. So YouTube as a platform is changing. It's going to become harder to stay within YouTube's terms of service if you are an electronic cigarette reviewer. It's going to become a lot harder to do it, especially under that worrying new drug categorization with the whole... They actually mention nicotine in it as well. It's actually mentioned in there now. It's in there in black and white. That whole section is very worrying for electronic cigarette reviewers. Very worrying. There is another way around it, though. 
simply vape on zero nicotine when you're vaping on camera. There's no nicotine. There's no drugs. Simple as that. However, again, all your previous videos, and in my case all 2,100 of them, are all retroactively added into the new toss. So, uh, fuck me, really. <sighs> so on top of that, you also have the Instagram purge, which is happening right now. Instagram are basically shutting down vape promoters. You know the that whole thing that that whole thing that goes on over <laughs> over and look at the juice. Don't look at the tits. Look at the juice. That whole thing that goes on in Instagram that is slowly being shut down. In Instagram, Instagram have now publicly stated that they are now going after vape promoters and electronic cigarette promoters on the Instagram platform and that's a lot to do with who owns Instagram because it's owned by Facebook and Facebook's been slowly turning those thumb screws on the Facebook platform to slowly squeeze out all the vaping groups and vaping pages over there. Again there's ways around it to fly under the radar but it's not looking good in social media folks, it really isn't. If you're a normal vapor in a Facebook group you will have seen the changes happening to that Facebook group. If you're a reviewer, it's going to get hard. Um, it's going to get really hard. Now, there is ways to get round these new draconian laws come in and simply start vaping zero milligram e-liquid. That's you. The drug thing's gone because you're vaping on no nicotine. But it's, it's the constant rule changes that go on. It's YouTube constantly shifting the goalposts left and right so you can't fucking score a goal. That's what YouTube are becoming really good at these days. Now, I have opened a BitChute account. I will not be linking to it right now, though. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing with the BitChute account is simply using it as a backup, just in case. So all the videos that have, that have been getting produced in this channel, at least since the beginning of December, are now being uploaded to BitChute as a backup, just in case the worst happens to the YouTube platform. But I honestly cannot see YouTube swinging the ban hammer as furiously on the e-cigarette review scene as they have been on other scenes in YouTube. Because... Yes, we're vape reviewers, but the vape review scene is a lot like the vape community as a whole. We police ourselves. If there's a vape reviewer doing something dodgy, like obviously marketing themselves towards kids, we call them out. The vape reviewer, vape reviewers, even though half the reviewers don't talk to each other, but the vape reviewers generally tend to police within our own ranks, so... I can't see YouTube going gung-ho with the ban hammer on e-cigarette reviewers just yet. 2021, however, that's when it'll probably happen, but at least for 2020, I don't think it will. I don't think it will. So, uh, we've covered practically most of 2020, and I'll be honest, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. Everything hinges. Everything hinges on what happens with the PMTA in May. If the PMTA does not happen and the FDA is able to kick it further down the road, things will be a lot better than what I've just said at the back half of this video. If the PMTA does happen, then the forefront war is on. It will happen you will see the speed up of the conglomeration of the e-liquid industry. You will see the collapse of the entire, at least, e-liquid industry in the United States. If the PMT includes hardware, which I think it will, the whole vaping industry is gone in the United States. It's just gone. It's gone. You will see the conglomeration and amalgamation of large companies in Shenzhen and China. And when all this conglomeration and amalgamation is finished, by the end of 2021, what these e-liquid people were saying to me, with 20 to 25 brands on the store shelf, all owned by five companies, that will come true. 
However, the worrying aspect of this is what happens with the hardware side of the market if the same thing happens in Shenzhen. 15 to 25 brands like Watofo, Vapefly and all that stuff, but all of them owned by Smok, Aspire, Geek Vape, possibly. I don't think Vandy Vape would survive, so they would probably fall under Geek Vape again. Joytech, they're big enough to survive. And Inokin. That's the names of the major players in the United States who have got the capital in the bank to ride the waves of the PMT happening and to then gobble up what's left of the industry over in China. If that happens, the consolidation of both wings of the vaping industry, you're going to look you're going to be looking at a very, very different outlook for the vaping industry come the end of 2021. And it will all start to happen this not this year, this is 2019. It will all start to happen next year in 2020. So that's something to look out for. Cross your fingers that the PMTA doesn't happen, folks. Because if it does, we're fucked. I'm saying it now, we're fucked. That's it. We're done. It may take two to two and a half years for the industry to fall, but it will fall. Everything hinges on the United States. And there we go, folks. That was a rather depressing outlook in things. So, uh, yeah, Kelpie, before we wrap this up, Kelpie First Look, uh, the introduction video for the Kelpie, will be up on, that's the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, should be up on the 4th of January, it'll be the first video up in the channel after the new year, so the Kelpie First Look should be up on the 4th of January, uh, I'll, be up, I'll be up at the studio on Friday the 3rd of January to record this and record the table cam stuff for the reviews coming up the following week, so as for this channel, back to the usual, it'll be back to the reviews, uh, after the new year, I am going to be doing uh, more. Uh, well, I'm going to be starting up again the uh, Patreon, Subscribe Star, and YouTube member only live streams. Uh, that they'll probably start up midway through January once I'm back in the swing of things with the reviews again. Uh, I'm also toying with the idea of doing a midweek vaping news video that will be no more than 10 to 15 minutes long, just giving all the major headlines of what's happening in the vaping industry from the previous week and my quick thoughts on it, because we have got to keep a very close eye on what's happening in Europe and what's happening in the United States for 2020. We're going to have to keep a very close eye on what's happening. Anyway... <laughs> This is why I hate DNA boards, this whole standby thing. There we go. Well, that battery's flat. Weak battery, that figures pop you there. I love this thing, by the way. Review for this is up next week. Is it next? No, week after next week. That's when it's up. Anyway, I think we'll wrap it up there, folks. I've probably babbled for about an hour and a half now. I know that the back half of this for the 2020... The 2020s, that, well, 2020 is going to be very depressing, but if the PMT doesn't happen, things are looking a bit better, put it that way. Anyway, that is it from me, folks. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all on January the 4th for the up-close and first look of the Kelpie RDA. Have a good one. <laughs>